All right, let's go ahead and begin your week seven lecture. Today we're going to talk about the Texas governor and the executive branch in general. Uh, but before we go ahead and get started, there's just a few things to discuss. Uh, the first thing is your extra credit for this week. So your extra credit this week is to register to vote. I want you to register to vote and just provide me with proof that you registered to vote or are currently registered as well. Uh, this is for two points of extra credit. You can send me a scan of your registration card. You can send me a scan of your registration application as well if you need to. You can do that uh, through email or you can uh, video chat me real quick on Skype and show it to me or you can also visit during my office hours here on campus and just present me with the card or the application. However, uh, there are certain people that can't register to vote, and I've gotten a lot of emails on this topic that you're, you can't qualify, you don't qualify to register to vote, and, and, and I understand that. Um, so if you can't register to vote, this is all you need to do for your two points of extra credit. In a Word document, I just need you to list all the qualifications for voting in Texas, all of them. You can do this easily with a Google search. Just Google search something like Texas voter registration requirements or something like that, and it should pop up. And then list those and then tell me which one of the qualifications you do not meet and why. So it could just simply be that you're underage and you don't meet the age requirement yet. So tell me which ones you don't meet um, and then tell me why and just put that in a Word document and put it into the extra credit drop box and you'll get your two points of extra credit. But if you do qualify, uh, just send me a scan of your registration application card or your registration card in general. So should be easy. Uh, the other thing I want to talk to you about was discussion boards. You guys are doing a really, really good job. I was very highly impressed with your discussion boards last week, so just keep that up. Uh, and then also, I want you to keep in mind the writing guide uh, folder and the writing assignment. It's, we're about two months out from the writing assignment being due, but I definitely want you to start thinking about the issue that you guys want to talk about, and I want you to review the writing guide lecture, so that way you guys are prepared for that. So. That being said, let's go ahead and get on to today's lecture. It should be a fairly short lecture as the Texas governor doesn't have a whole lot to it and you guys already probably know a lot about the Texas governor in general. So here we go. These are just the general functions of an executive branch. Executive branch usually contains the governor as well as a number of agencies and staff under the governor. So the executive branch, first and foremost, is responsible for the administration of laws. They're the administrative branch of the government overall. And this is why in many textbooks you'll see the executive branch lumped in with the Texas, or uh, lump, the executive branch lumped in with the bureaucracy. They're often part of the same kind of arm of government. So they administer the laws. They also are responsible for elaboration of the laws, meaning pol policy making. Often the executive branch drafts its own version of bills and resolutions and submits them to the legislative branch for it to be passed. So that would be the example of elaboration of laws, the policy making itself. <coughs> the executive branch is also responsible for political leadership. Not only uh, political leadership in terms of party and keeping the party unified, but also in terms of policy initiation as well. They demonstrate the leadership to initiate policy. The executive branch is also responsible for clemency. Clemency is also a huge uh, function of the executive branch in general. And so the uh, clemency is examples of, would be examples of pardons, reprieves, commutations, and paroles. They're very much responsible for uh, the kind of judicial sort of, sort of decisions as well, which is, all falls under clemency. And then there is uh, symbolic and ceremonial functions as well. The president appears at, uh, or sorry, not the president, uh, the governor appears at uh, college graduations and certain so just sorts of social functions. So that would be an example of being symbolic and ceremonial. But let's go ahead and talk uh, about the Texas governor. Now the Texas governor itself is a very kind of unique institution, uh, particularly when compared to other states and how, and how the Texas governor fares. But let's first talk about just the qualifications to be Texas governor. To be Texas governor, the, the Texas Constitution of 1876 outlines these qualifications. You must be 30 years of age, you must be a U.S. citizen, and you must be have been a resident of Texas for five years. So that's kind of unique because in many ways this leaves it susceptible to out-of-state people becoming Texas governor. To be Texas governor, you only have to be resident of Texas for five years, uh, and you also only have to be 30 years of age. So many young people that are moving into 
Texas could have certain political aspirations. Now, that being said, the kind of party system is already established, so it probably won't happen. It's just interesting that it leaves that door open and it often invites uh, people with political ambitions into, into Texas. In terms of compensation, the Texas governor uh, gets $150,000 a year, which is above the national average. For being a relatively weak governor, which we're going to talk about on the next few slides, they get a decent salary overall, and they get uh, above the national average, and $150,000 a year. You also get housing. There's the governor's mansion, and then you also get uh, paid transportation. So that's also a very nice compensation as well. Now, in terms of in terms of terms, pun intended, I guess. There, for in speaking of terms, they each governor is elected to a four-year term. However, there are no limits on how many terms they can serve. Traditionally, most presidents have not sought a second term, or after they have served a second term, they have moved on to other things. So, usually, it's an eight years max. It's the norm is four. But most recently, uh, the most recent former, go former governor, Rick Perry, he served 14 years, which is the longest that anyone has ever served as governor. And it's because of this no term limits. And that probably will be on your test is that there is no term limits for the governor. So the, uh, the governor can serve as, as long as he wants. And Rick Perry was the longest serving governor and he served for 14 years. So elected to four, four year terms, no term limits though, and can serve as long as he wants. Our current Texas governor is Greg Abbott, and it will be interesting to see if he seeks a second term or if he, he carries his tenure longer than Rick Perry, because he was formerly the lieutenant governor under Rick Perry. Now, currently, Greg Abbott is a Republican, and he tends to side on the conservative side of ideology. Like I said, he was former, formerly the lieutenant governor under Rick Perry. His election just happened in 2004, and he defeated the, the Democratic candidate, Wendy Davis, in the 2014 general election. Uh, the campaign was one of the most expensive in Texas. It certainly wasn't the most expensive. The most expensive campaign probably came in 2002. But that being said, there was 130, uh, not 130, sorry, $83 million spent between both candidates. And that was a pretty expensive campaign just to win governor of Texas. You had a lot of out-of-state donors. Texas was a highly, highly profiled case in the 2014 election. You had a uh, you had a very popular Democratic candidate, and you also had a popular Republican candidate as well. So you had a lot of out-of-state donors, which contributed to this $83 million spent. Uh, <clears throat> on Greg Abbott's side, you had uh, famous people such as, as Donald Trump and Sarah Palin and Troy Aikman. They all donated to the Greg Abbott campaign. On, and for Winnie Davis, you had people uh, such as uh, Willie Nelson and, and Tom Cruise and other uh, famous Democratic side uh, politicians and things like that. So it was $83 million spent to win the 2014 election, but Greg Abbott did defeat Wendy Davis by a pretty uh, handy margin at the time. And so it'll be interesting to see how Greg Abbott's governorship plays out. Uh, it's relatively young. He just got inaugurated uh, not too long ago. So to see how his governorship will play out will certainly will certainly be interesting, but I want you to have the information that he is your current current governor. If you want to do more research on Greg Abbott, uh, certainly do so. And part of your discussion board question for this week will be discussing Greg Abbott and his governorship. So, moving on, let's go talk about the governor its governorship itself, the Texas governor's powers. And these are when I talk about the governorship, I just mean the institution of the governor, not the governor himself. So the Texas governor's power, uh, comparatively, the Texas governor is one of the weakest. In fact, uh, your textbook talks about Thad, uh, Thad Bell. Institutional powers granted by the Constitution are really limited. And Thad Bell, he came up with this five-point scale on how strong a governor is. And he gave Texas a rating of 2.8. So the Constitution limits the powers of the govern governor, and it really reflects in this power index created by Thad Bell. 36 other governors have more power than the Texas governor. And it's because of the way the Texas government is structured. It's inherently stacked against the governor getting too much power. Instead, a lot of the power lies with the legislative branch and also the bureaucratic agencies of Texas. Those are really the two institutions of government that run Texas, not necessarily the governor. Now, because they have such weak institutional powers granted by the Constitution, what well, really how they compensate for that is their personality politics. Typically in Texas, what you see with the governors is you see strong mandates, meaning that they have really wide popular support. And at, at large, the public supports them tremendously. And you see this 
uh, because it, particularly because it's a one-party state usually, whether that be Democrat, it's Democrat one era and then Republicans one era. But they do have strong mandates. They often win by 60-40 margins, and they're very po wildly popular among, among the population of Texas. Also, they have strong personality politics in the fact that they have political ambition. A lot of governors of Texas go on to be uh, presidential candidates. You think of George W. Bush most recently. He was a Texas governor, and he also went on to win the presidency. Most recently, Rick Perry. Rick Perry ran uh, for for had a presidential campaign in 2012, and there's often talk about him, him running in 2016 as well. So they have a lot of political ambition. Uh, lack of term limits. Lack of, lack of term limits also allows them to, to project their personality in many ways. Because they have the lack of term limits, they can stick around for a while, and they can increase their popular mandate, and therefore, because they're popular, they can increase their influence uh, and expand the powers of the governor that way. And then also kind of going with political ambition is the national spotlight. They, a lot of people turn their eyes to Texas because the way that Texas goes uh, and the way that Texas is growing and the way the economy of Texas is growing brings a lot of spotlight into uh, who's running Texas and how the government is faring. And the governor, as the face of Texas, is really highlighting Texas in many, many ways in the national spotlight. So that's how, even though they're limited, uh, they're limited in terms of constitutional power. They do have a lot of informal type of powers through their personality and their their way, the way they're charismatic and the way they can get things, they can talk to people and get things done. That's how the governor really tries to influence and exert his power over Texas politics. So keep that in mind for your test. Constitutionally speaking, institutionally speaking, the governor is very weak, but personality-wise and having connections, the Texas governor is actually very, very strong. So. Texas governor, his powers generally tend to fall into these three classes, and this is the way that your textbook classifies these powers. The Texas governor has a legislative power. Uh, he can exercise the veto. He can call spe special sessions of the legislature. He offers an address to the legislature every year. And he can also declare legislative emergencies. So these are actually granted by the Constitution, and they're way that there's there they are ways that the governor can influence the legislative process within Texas. He also has judicial powers. I talked about those clem clemency powers. Uh, he can grant pardons, reprieves, and stays of executions, uh, as well as commutations and things like that. So those are all judicial powers. What he does within the judicial decisions and the judicial powers uh, of the state, he he has a certain influence over those as well. But most importantly is his executive powers. He is part of the executive branch, and so he has to exercise these executive powers. Appointment and removal. He can, he can appoint uh, particular office holders within the bureaucracy, and he can also remove them if they're, if they're doing a bad enough job. But often he nominates those that are within his own political party or along with his own political ideology. And so speaking of Rick Perry, Rick Perry was around for a long time. He had 14 years. And through this appointment and removal, power of the executive branch, he was able to surround himself or fulfill p government, government positions with people of his same ideology and his same views. So many of those people are still in the same positions. So for years to come, uh, the influence of Rick Perry will definitely be seen throughout Texas. And Greg Abbott being part of Rick Perry's former administration will probably allow those appointments to continue. So Rick Perry's influence is definitely going to stick around for a while through this appointment and removal po power of the Texas governor. Now, the Texas governor also has certain budgetary powers. He doesn't make up the budget, but he does provide suggestions for the budget. He also has directory and supervisory positions over the Texas bureaucracy. And also he has uh, command of the Texas National Guard. So he has certain military and law enforcement powers as well. We're gonna go ahead and break down each of these just a little bit more, um, beginning with the gov governor's executive powers. The appointment power. He appoints all positions to agencies, boards, and etc. Not otherwise provided for law. Um, so he does. Uh, he appoints all these positions, uh, but he does have certain limits on the appointment power as well, though, uh, such as staggered terms. Uh, so he can't. Uh, he can't nominate everyone all at the same time. They do have staggered terms. Senatorial courtesy and senator, Senate approval. Even though he does appoint these sort of positions, they do have to be approved by the Senate, or at least he has to notify the Senate that he's going to appoint these people. And so there's senatorial courtesy and the Senate approval for some positions as well. 
and also the non-salary salaried nature of most jobs. Most jobs do not have their own salary. Instead, that salary is approved by the legislative branch and put within the budget. There's also interest group pressure as well. There's interest group pressures that say, maybe you shouldn't nominate this guy, you should nominate this guy for this office. And all of these are sort of outside influences on the governor's executive powers. But overall, he does tend to get things pushed through, and he does tend to appoint and have them approved by the Senate, being that Texas is a one-party state. Now, the removal powers are just limited to persons appointed by the governor, uh, and two-thirds of Senate approval is required to have them removed. So. The governor can remove people, but it has to be approved by the Senate once again. That being said, just like the appointment powers, though, the Senate is of the same uh, party uh, affiliation, so getting things through isn't really that difficult. Also within executive powers, he has budget powers. He proposes a budget every year. Now, it's not that that budget is, is actually the budget that passes through the legislative branch at all. It's just simply a proposal. The governor also has the item veto, which is very interesting. Most governors actually do not have that. The item veto says is basically that if the governor does not approve of something in the budget, he can just nix that out. And so it's it's kind of controversial because the legislative branch is usually the one that, that drafts the budget, and for him to nix something that the legislative branch wants uh, can be controversial at times, but that being said, he still does have that power of that item veto. Once the budget is passed through the legislative branch, he has the budget execution authority, and this is uh, limited and only upon recommendation by the legislative uh, budget board. We talked about the legislative budget board last time. But that being said, he does execute the budget and he tries to get everything in the budget through and put into place. So that would be the example of the governor's budget powers. In terms of military, he does appoint the adjutant general which is just kind of the overseer of the, of the Texas National Guard or, or uh, military power of Texas. So he appoints the adjutant general. He may order mobilization of the National Guard for natural disasters and peacekeeping or things like that. So if there's a particular emergency within Texas, the Texas governor has the power to mobilize the National Guard. In terms of law enforcement, he appoints the Public Safety Board, which oversees law enforcement, and he may direct the Texas Rangers to take action. So he oversees the Texas Rangers, uh, which is basically the kind of state troopers of Texas. So those are his particular military and law enforcement powers. Uh, those aren't usually exercised that often. There may be certain times which it's necessary to exercise those powers, but overall they're strictly constitutional and not generally exercised all that often. Now flipping from executive powers to judicial powers, uh, the governor has certain judicial powers. He appoints the Board of Pardons and Paroles. He may issue a 30-day stay of execution as well, and he may, upon recommendation of the Board of Pardons and Paroles, issue pardons, which are full and conditional pardon. There's full and conditional pardons, uh, and then there's commutations of sentence, which means just reductions. Uh, so pardons means that you're fully acquitted of your crime, you're free to go. Commutations just mean they, that he reduces the sentences, or uh, that they reduce the sentences of particular prisoners or things like that. So those are his judicial powers. Judicial powers are generally limited. The governor tends to stay out of judicial politics, and he, he lets the judges and things like that decide. But he can, if necessary, exercise certain judicial powers and kind of step into the business of the judicial branch. The governor has a certain amount of staff. We talked about last last week with the with the legislative branch how they have certain staffs and it's very limited because it's not a full time position. Well, the governor's kind of different. The governor actually has to stay or not really stay in Texas technically, but he has to kind of know what's going on in the state full time. Now. In terms of governor staff, though, you have uh, currently you have approximately 137 positions under the governor, which is quite a few compared to the staff for the legislative branch. The governor has a lot more, a lot more staff because he has to stick around for for longer. The major responsibilities of the staff include, and remember this is just a sample, but it includes a number of things, including appointments, uh, budget and planning, disability committee you know, the film commission, emergency management, things like that, communications, legislative office, all of this. All, they have a, a large responsibility to take care of Texas and ensure that things are running smoothly. And this is all part of, kind of, all of this is part of the executive powers and trying to enforce laws and things like that. And the staff is really the one that makes that thing sort of happen. 
So that's the governor's staff. Uh, it's not really anything that's going to be on your test, really, but it's just it's important to mention nonetheless. This is what's really important for your test, the plural, the plural executive. The plural executive is so unique to Texas. Remember, the governor is really constitutionally weak. It's one of the weakest governors in the United States. And this is because of the way the Constitution is designed, it set up this plural executive. And it said, we'll have a governor. The governor can, can be there. However, he's not going to have a lot of powers. What we're going to do instead is establish this plural, plural executive which establishes these offices that are independent of the governor and may, may even be of a different party. So it establishes these offices, the, the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, the comptroller, the comptroller of public accounts, the commissioner of general land office, and the commissioner of agriculture. And these are all independent agencies set up by the Constitution or added onto the Texas government as a, as a necessary department. And these all see certain, oversee certain things within the state independent of the governor. So the governor has no say of what goes on in these departments here. And that's the idea of the plural, plural executive. We'll have a governor, we'll give him some power, but he's not going to be able to control such things as agriculture and public accounts and land and things like that. He won't be able to oversee or rule on any of those things. Instead, some independent agency is going to do that. And so that's the idea of the plural executive. I hope that makes sense, and uh, I hope you can understand exactly what the plural executive is. If, there, if not, there's plenty of YouTube videos on it as well. But the plural executive says, we're going to have a governor, and then we're going to have these offices that are independent of the governor to check the governor's power and to limit the governor's power. And that's why it's very interesting that they could be also of different parties, though traditionally they're not. So let's go ahead and talk about one of those, or, yeah, the second one there, the Attorney General Office. The Lieutenant Governor is just kind of second in command to the Governor. He's just the Vice President, basically, so he's not really that important to talk about. Although the Lieutenant Governors tend to go on to be Governors. So let's go ahead and talk about the Attorney General. Uh, the Attorney General is just basically the state's chief legal officer in civil cases. So anything that has, a, has to deal with a civil case, not a criminal case, not a criminal law case, a civil law case, the Attorney General is the, chief's, is the state's chief legal officer. He represents the state in legal actions and civil lawsuits. He represents the state. He enforces the state antitrust and consumer protection laws, so he protects consumers uh, from monopolies, and he breaks up monopolies and things like that, and he ensures that the economy, is, or is, tries to ensure that the economy is, is fair and, and balanced, sort of. So... The, he also issues opinions on legal questions. If there's a legal question out there, he will issue an opinion and so that uh, lower courts may take that into account into their decisions. He collects child support where counties have been unable to do so, so he oversees the child support uh, laws within Texas, and he administers the Victims Assistance Pro Grants programs as well. So the Attorney General, uh, anything that has to do with, deal with civil cases, he's, a, he's ahead of that, but he also enforces certain amounts of policy uh, which take away from the governor's power. And those tend to deal with civil actions, such as child abuse and things like that. So the Attorney General has a very important job um, and a, is a very big office and definitely a sought-out sought out office in terms of elections uh, by politicians. So, Comptroller Public Accounts, uh, this is just really easy. Public Accounts is just anything to do with financing. He, uh, Comptroller of Public Accounts will collect taxes. He'll, they will also offer budget estimates. And on, he, they are honestly a custodian of most, most of the state funds, pays the state bills. So anything to do with accounting, basically. That's what a comptroller of public accounts is. And is an elected office as well. And so uh, it's very interesting that someone is elected just to uh, deal with budgets and accounts. But that's, that's exactly what the comptroller of, of public accounts is. State Land Commissioner. Uh, land Commissioner is just basically oversees all the public lands within Texas. So state parks and things like that, that's what the State Land Commissioner does. Many of many states actually don't have a Land Commissioner. Texas is very unique in the fact that it does have a Land Commissioner to oversee these sorts of things. So responsible for supervising all state-owned lands, like I said, all the public lands. Administers veteran, Veterans Land Fund as well. Texas has a Veteran Lands Fund in which certain amount of lands are guaranteed to veterans and prepares and administers coastal zone management program. Texas has a large Gulf Coast area. We experienced that here in Galveston. So even offshore, 
uh, just uh, miles offshore. The Texas Land Commissioner oversees that as well. So very important job, uh, particularly in terms of environment and ensuring that there's a sustainable environment here in Texas. The State Land Commissioner is very, very important in that role. Department of Agriculture, obviously very important in Texas. Texas is a very large, large agricultural state, particularly in West and South Texas. Uh, so the Department of Agriculture implements laws regulating the agriculture sector of the economy, not covered by federal laws. Anything that's not covered by federal laws, remember we talked about federalism, the, Depart the Texas State Department of Agriculture is responsible for that. So they get to allow, they get to set state law, even though it may be in, in, in conflict with federal laws. But uh, that's the idea of federalism, which you guys really well studied. Consumer Protection, uh, Department of Agriculture deals with weights and measures, packing and labeling. Uh, so this deals with almost everything, weights and measures, even uh, gas stations. If you look on your gas, next time you fill up your tank with gas, you can look on there and say, it'll say Department of, certified by the Department of Agriculture, uh, Department of Weights and Measures or something like that. And look on the gas pump itself, it, it's on there, there's a sticker on there somewhere. And that's all, be, that's all part of the Department of Agriculture is that they do that uh, to ensure consumer protection and, and ensure consumer safety uh, with gas pumps even. But Weights and Measures deals with a number of, of economic items and Package and Labeling deals with a number of economic sectors as well. Department of Agriculture is also responsible for marketing programs for Texas agricultural products. It's in, it's in, it's an interest of the state to promote its agriculture sector in order to uh, improve the economy and things like that. So they need to market that for Texas agriculture products to promote it elsewhere, to be sold elsewhere as well. So that's a very important job here in Texas. Texas Railroad Commission, uh, regulation of intra intrastate railroad transportation. I say intrastate because any railroad, as soon as it reaches the state border, it's not part of the Texas Railroad Commission. Intrastate just means within the state of Texas. So Texas Railroad Commission is responsible for regulation of intrastate railroad transportation, regulation of mining and extractive industries, regulation of intrastate road transportation, intrastate once again, and regulation of pipelines as well. So the Railroad Commission was initially established just to deal with railroad transportation, but then as the economy developed and mining and extractive ad industries, uh, such as oil and things like that, that became part of the Texas Railroad Commission and also road transportation as that grew with the interstate system, uh, also became part of the Texas Railroad Commission. So, still deals with railroads, although railroads aren't as highly prevalent, uh, the Texas Railroad Commission still does deal with that and instead really tends to focus on road transportation, pipelines and oil and mining and extractive industries, which also deal with oil. So. Important job, uh, particularly because the oil sector is such a highly prevalent economic sector here in Texas. The Texas Railroad Commission is often a very, very important job. Uh, it often produces a highly competitive election as well. So, finally, you get the State Board of Education. The State Board of Education recommends the Commissioner of Education to the Governor and manages investments to the Permanent School Fund. The Permanent School Fund was established by the Constitution of 1876. Oversees the Texas public education system, uh, which needs to be in uh, needs to be consistent with the provisions of the Texas Education Code. So the State Board of Education is part of the executive branch as well, in the fact that it it has administrative duties for the education system here in Texas. So. The uh, structure of the Texas, Texas executive basically breaks down like this. You have officials that are appointed by the governor. Uh, so the governor does have certain powers as well in terms of who gets to be within the executive branch. Now all those offices that I just named, all of those past six or so slides, those were all elected officials. These are, these are officials that the governor gets to oversee. So he gets to appoint the Secretary of State. It's a constitutional office. It's within the Constitution that we need to have a Secretary of State. He gets to appoint the Adjutant General, which, I, like I said, oversees the kind of military aspect of Texas. He gets to appoint the Commissioner of Insurance, the Director of Housing and, Co of Community, uh, Director of Housing and Community Affairs, uh, Commissioner of Education. He gets to appoint that. And he is director, uh, or gets to appoint the director of the Texas Department of Health. So, those are certain powers that are granted to the governor to appoint these offices. Although, when you look at the overall administration of the state, those six or so past slides that I mentioned, those are the really, really important ones, particularly because they're part of the plural executive. So, 
Secretary of State, uh, get once, once again, appointed by the governor. Uh, chief election official of the state, they oversee, the Secretary of State oversees all, the, all of the elections within the state of Texas. Grants charters to corporations and processes uh, extradition, extradition requests as well. So extradition is any time that a criminal from another state moves into Texas and the, the state of origin wants to prosecute them, he grants those extradition requests for the state of, let's say, Oklahoma to come into Texas and prosecute a criminal here in Texas. Uh, or let's say if someone was on the run from Louisiana to Texas, the Texas Secretary of State would oversee that as well. But for the most part, uh, deals with just elections. Secretary of State is very responsible for elections. Anytime that you register to vote, you deal with some aspect of the Secretary of State and things like that. So that would be the main job of the Secretary of State. Now you also get uh, agencies that are headed by elected boards as well. And this would be the Texas Railroad Commission. Um, and I just really wanted to point out that even though the Texas Railroad Commission, the, the head of it is elected, there are there is um, the Railroad Commission itself, which you have three members that are elected statewide, uh, six year overlapping terms, and you receive a particular salary that is determined by the legislator. Now on the flip side of that, you have the State Board of Education, you have 15 members on the State Board of Education, you have four year overlapping terms and no salary at all. So. Those are just basically just trying to give you uh, an idea of exactly the composition of each of those. All right, so we've reached our discussion board questions. If you have any questions about the executive branch at all and what the offices do, feel free to send them my way. Almost all of this is online, though. Uh, if you want to just Google search a particular office itself, feel free to do so, and you can get a lot of information off the, off the web about each of these. So these are your discussion board questions for the week. Like I said, you guys did a fantastic job of discussion boards last time. I was so overwhelmingly impressed. Um, so let's try to keep that up and, and do that again this week. So for number one, uh, visit Greg's, uh, Greg Abbott's personal website. Greg Abbott is our governor right now, and I feel like you should maybe know just a little bit about him. So visit Greg, Ab Greg Abbott's personal website. I have provided the link here if you want to click on it. If not, it is just gregabbott.com. Pretty easy to follow. Or you can Google search Greg Abbott, and it should be the first thing that pops up. Anyways, on his personal website, follow the issues link, and it's on the top right there on the on your screen. You should just be able to click on that top right. Find an issue that Governor Abbott speaks about on this site and give your opinion. Do you agree with Greg Abbott's stance on the topic of your choice? Why or why not? Now remember, for your final essay, you're going to write a paper about a political issue that you care about. So you could uh, you could use this issue when writing your final essay for class. Maybe maybe copy and paste your response into a Word document, and you'll already have a paragraph or two written for your essay. That'd be that'd be fantastic. Anything for you to get, for you guys to get ahead. So. Um, I, but the main point of this question is that I want you to research Greg Abbott a little bit. I want you to know a little bit about your, your governor here in, here in the state of Texas. And I want you to formulate an argument or formulate an opinion on the issue itself. And as I've told you guys before, in terms of opinions, when you guys post opinions on the discussion board, I don't really care. I don't care what if you're conservative, liberal, libertarian, or populist. Either one. I just care that you guys have an opinion, that you're actively thinking about politics, and that you're actively engaged uh, and issues that are important to our modern times. So, should be easy enough. Number two, though, I want you to talk a little bit about our former governor. Uh, it's been shown, particularly in the past few decades, that Texas governors have found the national spotlight. And our former governor, Rick Perry, is no exception at all. Former Texas governor, Rick Perry, uh, he is considered running for 2016. I just want you to give me uh, your opinion on him. Uh, he is your uh, home state representative, I guess. Uh, he's your homeboy in many ways. So do you think that he will find success among the other candidates? Uh, and you can contrast him to other Republican candidates, or you can contrast him against Democratic candidates. Either one, whatever you want to do. Uh, just conduct a Google search if you're unsure of who else is running in 2016. There's a whole slew of candidates out there right now. Um, everyone from Mike Huckabee to Hillary Clinton to Elizabeth Warren. Um, to Jeb Bush. Uh, so there's a whole lot of candidates out there. Just compare them a little bit to each candidate. Tell me if you think he has a good chance of winning. Um, and then there's other things to consider in your answer. Consider the role of Texas uh, governors in your answer and also the national appeal of Texas. So Texas governors are typically weak 
But that doesn't mean that they're bad governors necessarily. It just means that they're constitutionally weak. But it does mean that they could be good politicians or they have a lack of experience being a good politician because the Texas governor is so weak. Give me your opinion on that as well. Also consider the national appeal of Texas. Consider that so many people are moving into Texas. It must mean that the government's not too bad, right? So think about that in your answer as well. But for the main part, just compare Rick Perry to other presidential candidates in 2016. And I have, I have no doubt that you guys will do, do well. So these are more opinion-based types of questions. I just want you guys to think about your own political views. Give me your own political views. Feel free to discuss. Uh, respond to one another's opinions. Um, and once again, if you do give, I have no problem giving out extra credit for people that actually do spend time on the discussion boards and respond to each other's questions. So feel free to do that. As, as well. I'm looking forward to your guys' responses and looking forward to your guys' political opinions as well. So, uh, that being said, that wraps up today's lecture. It wasn't too long, I hope. And next week, I believe we're going to talk about campaigns and finances, which is, which is a really fun lecture as well. Any questions, though, uh, please do send them my way. Other than that, have, have a good week.